Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we worship you this morning. We exalt your mighty and holy name. Indeed, we thank you for the faith of our fathers, Lord. We thank you for our families, the biological families that you've given to us, and the church family. We commit ourselves to you this morning. Father, may you speak to us. May you teach us. May you rebuke us. May you correct us, Lord, and may you prepare us for the good works that you have set aside for us. Lord, have your way as, we, as you use me to speak to you people. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Shall we be seated? Good morning once again, and praise the Lord. I thank the Lord this morning for the gift of life, and once again this weekend for the opportunity to share his word. I'm Alice Lau, I love the Lord, for he is my savior. Now, as I mentioned last Sunday, <coughs> we will be focusing on the call to build godly families. And our challenge, as we reflect on the various aspects of building godly families, will be to live out our faith in Christ by building godly families. And I pray that even as we make these reflections, we'll continuously think through what we are doing and to build our families. And, they are, and where we feel we have fallen short, we will remember to constantly turn to the Lord. Now, last Sunday, we reflected on whose idea the family is, and we learned that the family is indeed God's idea. It is his magnificent creation designed for a specific purpose. Now, our reflection today will be on the, under, the Christian understanding of the family. And from the readings this morning, we will see that the Christian understanding of the family is anchored on God's design for the family. The Christian understanding of the family is anchored on God's design for the family. Now, to a very large extent, our families are a place of refuge. They provide safe spaces where we can air our views without fear of rebuke. There are safe havens where we can be vulnerable. You know, you can feel free to share your deep feelings and even your fears. There are also places where we can share our ideas and the big dreams that we have. And there are places where we forge together, you know, where we are in fear. We can share our fears with our siblings and forge the way forward together. However, families can also be places where we are hurt most. We've heard of instances of unfaithfulness in marriages. We've heard of divorce. We've heard of rebellious children. We've heard of you know, parents who are absent, and sometimes they are not committed at all. We've seen infightings within the families. They're fighting over property. We've seen killings, and we've seen misunderstanding, like the case of the family of, of Christ. Now, what makes the difference? in how we run the affairs of family, in how we understand the family. Now, I believe it is our foundation of how we understand. Do we understand our family from God's viewpoint, or are we influenced <clears throat> by the world? Now, God's word remains the same despite the changing times. And when we have this as our foundation, then no matter how the world understands the family, we will always weigh our understanding against God's standard. Now, the understanding, the Christian understanding of the family has two main aspects. We have the biological aspect and the spiritual aspect. Now, starting with the biological aspect, in the Old Testament, we see families based on marriage and blood ties, right from our first parents, Adam and Eve. We see that they had children, they had sons, they had Cain, they had Abel, they had Seth. And we see their children also having families. We also see the family of Abraham and Sarah, and they expand through their sons, um, Jacob and Esau. Now, in these families of biological ties, we see the normal experiences and challenges that our families also go through today. And just looking at, you know, Cain, we see Cain killing his brother Abel out of jealousy. And we see Abraham insecure about Sarah's beauty. She asked Sarah not to reveal who she is. And um, 
We also see Sarah's insecurity because she was barren for a while and she even suggests to Abraham to have a child with her maid servant. And we also see parental favoritism in the family of Isaac and you know the sibling rivalry that arises between his two sons. And we also see this parental favoritism trickling down to Jacob himself, his family. And we see Joseph's brothers selling him out to, to Egypt. Now, we also see that these families were guided by God in their day-to-day -day life. They walked with God through the daily happenings of their lives. And God was very, you know, God's, whatever they did, how they related with one another, was under God's scrutiny. Now, for example, when we look at Genesis 4, just before Cain killed Abel, it started with an offering that he gave, which God did not look upon with favor. And God asked him why his soul was downcast. And God told him that if he does what is right, he will be accepted. God also forewarns him that sin is encroaching at his door, and it desires him, but he must master it. However, we see Cain ignoring God's warning, and he goes ahead and kills his brother. And we see God's constant presence in the lives of all the other families in the Old Testament. And so just looking at the biological families in the Old Testament, a few questions for us to consider this morning as we reflect on our understanding of the family. Is how will knowing that God is concerned about the daily affairs of your biological family including how you relate with each other, enhance or change how you relate with your family members. And also knowing that God calls upon us to live out our faith by building godly families. How will you work at doing what is right at all times that you may be accepted by God? And where have you allowed sin to encroach at your door in how you relate to your family? And how will you master this sin and relate to your family in the way that God has prescribed. Now, in the gospel reading, we see the biological family of Jesus concerned about his engagement in ministry, probably because they did not understand his purpose. In this passage, we see Jesus' priority to attend to the needs of the crowd that followed him, to the extent that he did not even have time to, to eat together with his disciples. And this is a wonderful example that Christ sets for us, that when we are engaged in ministry, when we prioritize that family, then we can afford to bear with great inconveniences of even losing a meal or going without a meal, but not fail to miss the opportunity to minister to our, to, to our church family. When his family hears about the situation, they are concerned and they went to take charge of of him, for they said he is out of his mind. I'm sure most of us would do the same. You know, you will agree with me that tension has, you know, tension will sometimes arise if one member of the family spends their all time in, in the service, we, especially when they have not explained. And so one way of ensuring we understand one another's actions is by sharing our vision and sharing that which we intend to do. But I'm sure Jesus' family already understood their, their, his vision. They knew he was the savior of the world. Probably they didn't comprehend what all this entailed, and that's why they probably thought that he was out of his mind. I pray that in our families, our biological families, we will take time to understand one another, to know one another's vision, that we may not assume that our loved ones are out of their mind, but we may be there to support them even as they serve in ministry. Now, in the same passage, we see Jesus clarifying who his family is, and that is whoever does God's will in the last verses. Now, this is where we get the second aspect of the Christian understanding of the family, and this is founded on the spiritual ties. And for us, this is an encouragement that you know we are part of God's family, we are part of Jesus' family because we are doing his father's will. In the second reading, the epistle reading, the, the, the New Testament reading, Paul had a similar understanding. He addresses Timothy as his dear son and he thanks God for him and mentions how he constantly remembers Timothy's faith. 
which he traces back to his mother and grandmother. Now, Paul also acknowledges the family in two contexts. One, connected by obedience to Christ, and that's why he calls Timothy his son. And he also points out what influenced Timothy's face, and he traces this to his biological family. Now, Paul is such an example. He felt warm affection towards Timothy because he was an instrument of his conversion, and they both worked in the Lord's vineyard. And we see Paul heavily investing in spiritual time, in his time, and you know, in his, we see him heavily investing in Timothy, his spiritual son, and he takes time to mentor him and walk with him. He models the kind of understanding we should have for our families. And he also had a positive opinion generally about his church family, and he always hoped for the best concerning them. And so a question for us, again, from Paul this morning, is who is our Christian family? And like Paul has challenged us, can we take time and invest in our Christian family and mentor them so that they can grow in faith? Now, for those of us who are godparents, or even for those of us who've been best couples, what a wonderful opportunity for us to nurture these families and that, you know, point them towards Christ. God has given, an, uh, given us an opportunity to work with them, to mentor them. May we take full advantage of that opportunity. And so as Christians, our understanding of the family should not only be drawn from the biological ties, but also from the spiritual ties that was clearly pointed out by Jesus and modeled by Paul. You know, for Jesus, his Christian family came first. And he went out of his way to attend to the needs that he didn't even mind about what he was going to eat. And this is, for us, a very good reason why we should honor those that fear the Lord and choose them as part of our family. When we have this kind of understanding, we will take time also to be part of the church family, including the activities that are undertaken within the church. And right now at the cathedral, I know there are many activities that take place. We have the Wednesday prayer by women, very early in the morning at 5 a.m. The same Wednesday we have prayers in the evening in church that are open to every other person. We have mentorship programs for both men and women. We have money enough, we have ropes, we have the cell groups, we have so many things that are going on. And once again, as we consider our ways, my question for us this morning, for myself included, is are we part of these church family programs? And if we are, may the Lord strengthen us, that we may continue to build the church family as well, without tiring. And if we are not part of these church families and activities, can we consider how we can be part of these families? And so as I conclude, may we always remember that families are a place to go. May our families provide safe havens where we are well understood and supported. Let us uphold the biological family as a place to experience divine blessings and work towards building relationships that will support and strengthen our family life. But also let us remember the family Christ placed, or the importance that Christ placed on the family of faith. Those who do the will of God are his family, and we are all part of God's family. So let us pray that God will show us what is it that he wants us to do with our church family. And again, the church family can be a healing family to those who don't know what a healthy family looks like. Like the biological family, may the family of faith also be a family where people receive God's divine blessings and not pain, where they receive forgiveness and love even as we started off this morning, and where they mature in their Christian faith, that God's name will always be honored and glorified. I share this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the biological families that you've entrusted to us, and for the spiritual, the church family that you've given to us. Father, we pray that you will direct how we conduct the relationships of these families. And we pray, Lord, that your name will be always honored in how we relate with one another in the biological families and even in the church family. And Lord, we pray that just like your son gave special attention to the church family, 
May we also give uh, special attention to the church family, Lord, that you will forever be magnified. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.